And then three, two. Good afternoon. The first item we have is a presentation on the preliminary design for Towson High School's renovation and replacement. And for that, I call on Mr. Dixit and staff. Uh, good afternoon and thank you, Ms. Harvey, uh, Chair of the Facilities Committee. Uh, as part of the capital improvement program that board has approved, um, Towson High School is one of the project. The project entails uh, renovation of the historical part of the building and construction of new part consistent with the 21st century educational requirements. Today we are here to present preliminary design for your review and before we pass on to the architect, I just want to have some acknowledgments here. I want to thank uh, Dr. Sam Mustifer, Ms. Char Charlene Demino, principal of the school, and members of my team, headed by Mr. Plate, who's the office head of the Office of Construction and Improvement, and Mike Archbold, manager of planning, and Jonathan Palatoro, uh, who's the project manager. With this, uh, I'm going to transfer to Rand Elkovich of Smolin Emmer Elkovich. Thank you and thank you for having us here today. We're very excited to share with you our progress on the Towson High School. A quick agenda for today's presentation. We'll talk about the project's goals and challenges. Uh, we'll share what we found out at the existing Towson High School um, and then our study of next generation learning. And then based on the fact that this is a historically significant structure, how we developed the scope for that project before we could start designing, and then ultimately the design solution and how that design solution might be implemented that, that was generated from that scope. Um, zooming out a bit, vicinity map, um, Towson High School exists inside the 695 uh, circle, just north of the city line of Baltimore City. Uh, it's east of Towson High School, as you see on the diagram on the right. Um, within a one and two mile radius, uh, being a semi-urban environment, there are a number of other K through 12 educational facilities uh, serving this and adjacent uh, high schools. Um, project goals and challenges were where we began, and the idea was really to develop a unique so solution to serve the Towson community, and a solution that respected the history of the project, but also was designed to promote next generation learning environments. Um, Numerically, the project was also required to address increased student capacity going from its current rate capacity of 1,260 students to an EdSpec design of 1728 when we open, along with a core capacity of 1860, which is for future planning for future expansion. Uh, the project will be designed with safety and security in mind, being designed with principles of crime prevention through environmental design, and it will be designed to be sustainable both during its construction process and in longevity, uh, and will be plant, we'll be planning to meet a Green Globes 2 globe rate rating. Um, project certainly came with its challenges. The existing area of 205,000 square feet is significantly deficient of the EdSpec area of 320,000 square feet. In addition to the physical area of the building, the building itself has some significant physical limitations and the site is very limited as well, which we'll show you some more diagrams about in a moment. And one final challenge is that students will remain on site during the construction process. So we'll be having to design in a way that the building can be constructed ultimately in phases. Um, these are some images of the existing Towson High School. You see on the right the existing site, which not only is uh, relatively small for a high school site, but also very oddly shaped. Uh, so you can see fitting a lot of the amenities and programs that the site requires is going to be a challenge on the site, which led us to a very early determination that the building design will have to significantly keep its footprint as small as possible. And to do so, we'll go vertical, and we'll talk about that shortly as well. On the left, you see some images of the existing building, and you can see with the ceiling heights, column placement, it there are spaces that are really not conducive to the types of environments that we're looking to develop for next generation learning. Going forward in our study uh, into the existing building and, and learning objectives of the pedagogy, um, on the right are a series of diagrams of the program, and those diagrams are relative to the existing facility at Towson High School. And anything shown in red is a space that is either deficient in its size or lacking altogether. So you can see a great deal of, of program that we're looking to achieve with our new project. On the left is an additional diagram that then talks about how these programs have to interrelate to each other to get the appropriate cross content collaboration and the types of learning that we're trying to accomplish uh, for the student of tomorrow. 
uh, because our goal with Towson High School's project is to move from the traditional learning environments that you see on the left, which are really designed for an industrial age workforce to a next generation learning environment that really prepares our students for the career and college readiness that we're, we're preparing them for and the types of environments they'll be working on in the future. Um, as I mentioned, the project is very historically significant in nature. Uh, so before we could really start designing, we really had to engage the community and consulting party meetings to determine what the actual scope and appropriate scope for this project can be. Uh, through that process of, of collaboration, we determined a historic period of significance between 1947 and 1953. Uh, we determined which pieces of the building were most significant and most visible to the community. And working in collaboration really determined what parts of the building could be demolished to make way for the new construction uh, that would make this a school for the future uh, simultaneously. Um, so we, we did come to agreement and a really nice consensus uh, with the community of what that should be. Uh, before you, you have the existing site plan of the Towson High School. You can see it is bound to the west by Cedar Avenue and to the north by Egberth Road. It also contains a stream in it which bifurcates the site with the stadium and additional play fields on the east and the high school itself on the west uh, of that stream. One other comment I'd like to note is the significant topography on the site. It slopes from the northwest to the southeast pretty significantly, um, and this is a low area on the site, which is going to be relevant uh, as we show you how the design evolved. Um, this is the proposed new site plan of Towson High School. Um, we can see that in this proposed new plan, we will be reversing the main entrance to face to the east, the location of the existing parking area um, and where many people actually access the building will be the new main entrance. We will be retaining the historic entrance from Cedar Avenue and that will be used as primarily a staff entrance and ingress and egress uh, at drop off and delivery time uh, in the afternoon after school. Uh, there will also be an evening performing arts entrance as well as an evening athletic entrance so those areas can be closed off for evening use uh, without opening access to the entire building. Um, the main access to the school from free vehicular traffic is from Egberth Road, which is a two way road um, and a little bit wider than Cedar Avenue, which is one one direction. So most buses vehicles will be coming from this location. Uh, we will be developing a new bus loop. It will have stripe uh, bus parking uh, and will be completely separate from any other circulation paths and parking areas. Uh, buses will be able to come in from Egberth Road, park in the same location every time so students always know where their bus is, and then easily be able to egress back out to Egberth Road. Likewise, um, we will be developing a drop-off pickup loop for parent drop-off and safe uh, pickup and delivery of students. Those parents will come in from Egberth Road and drop their students directly on a sidewalk from where they can walk from the point of drop off to the front entry without ever crossing traffic. Uh, with this increased stacking length and ease of getting in and out, we're hoping to move this loop very quickly uh, for ingress and egress of parents and drop offs. Pedestrian pathways were also a very critical part of our site design strategy. Uh, we will be developing a pedestrian pathway for students coming from the north, going directly to the to the main entrance uh, from Egberth Avenue side. And likewise, for students from the west and the south, they will be able to access the building through the historic entrance on the west side. There will also be a series of safe pedestrian pathways and promenades connecting all of the site programs and the buildings, so gym to athletics, for example. Um, parking will also be increased slightly. There will be teacher staff parking on the west side of the school adjacent that staff entrance um, and increased parking capacity on the north and east side of the building as well. Services will also be entirely relocated to the south end of the building and you can see in this location they're completely out of the way of any of those other circulation patterns that I discussed earlier. Um, the project will also maximize the play fields and green space uh, on the remaining parts of the site. Um, and we also have an environment, an opportunity with the shape of the building to develop a secure outdoor learning environment, which you will see is adjacent to all the career technology education programs and gives an outdoor environment so for some of those larger and messier projects to be brought uh, into the outdoors, albeit in a very safe controlled uh, outdoor space. Uh, there will also be a new pedestrian bridge that will connect to the new athletic conference. 
uh, complex, and that will be now be a safe, uh, nice place. And we will be developing a, uh, we will be further developing the emergency access component to the athletics complex so that, God forbid, we have any incidents, those are, uh, can be handled appropriately. Um, moving into the building itself, uh, you can see the renovated classrooms to the north and to the west, as well as the renovated auditorium, which were the pieces that we determined with the historic consulting parties were important and relevant to the historic fabric of the building. And we really did follow the, the concept that was developed in that scoping of all the new construction being in, fit into the nook of those historic renovated areas. Uh, we'll start our tour of the building on the main level, the first floor plan. Um, we can see a new main entrance now on the east side rather than the west. And that new main entrance is directly adjacent to the administrative wing. And from that administrative wing, the administration can now surveil the entire drop off, pickup, and delivery sequence, as well as controlling the main entrance for security. Uh, there will be that new evening performing arts entrance. And between the admin and the auditorium, which will be renovated entirely into a state of the art facility inside, will be the new performing arts wing. Um, the, I mentioned the topography, the historic entrance that anyone familiar with Towson High School is used to from Cedar Avenue is actually one story above us. Um, and this gives us an opportunity to replace the back piece of the general ed wing with high volume career technology education programs. So activities like construction trades and electronics and such can use that larger volume space for the types of projects they'll be working. And in this location, they're directly adjacent that outdoor learning environment I mentioned before. I mentioned also that hill and that low area of the site and the evening athletic entrance, which actually, if you imagine this floor plate to work as a split level, is a story below that first floor main entrance. And on this floor, you can see all of our volume spaces, the gymnasium, the auxiliary gym, and the student commons, which is a multi-use large volume space that is both a cafeteria, a large gathering space, but can also be a pre-function space for the gym activities uh, using this evening and athletics entrance. Moving back up to see the entire first floor, it is separated between public noisy areas of the building and quieter academic uh, areas of the building uh, to the west. Any visitors to the building will be shuttled through the secure vestibule and have to be checked in through the administration before gaining access to the building. There will also be a series of cross corridor doors. Here you see one set se segregating the public noisy versus the private quieter academic spaces. Uh, there will also be doors that will separate separate that evening entrance for athletics so that athletics functions, folks that are coming to athletic functions don't have access to the entire building. And likewise, a series of doors that will do the same for the evening performances uh, to the auditorium. Throughout the building, there will be other sets of cross corridor doors which will allow us to secure the building and compartmentalize it in the event of an intruder event. Moving upstairs, this is the second floor, and on this floor we in, we introduce an elevated classroom wing. And the benefit of the elevated classroom wing is it allows us to develop a loop circulation. And the loop circulation on a scale on a project of a scale such as this really helps students with wayfinding throughout the building, but it's also a security advantage because it's very easy to surveil. You can imagine an administrator any two corners being able to surveil the entire corridor system. And in so doing, we can eliminate a lot of the bullying types of events that are typical in a school. This loop circulation will have a series of what we call collaborative learning areas uh, developed around it. And these are different types of differentiated learning environments outside of the classroom. So we're maximizing every square foot of the building for learning. And these are great spaces for students to collaborate, do projects together, and even cross content integration of different programs being able to work together in these collective public spaces. Um, that floor plate is anchored by the Learning Commons, uh, the center of the educational core. Um, directly across the corridor is a new career technology education program of interactive media, which we thought would have a really great adjacency between the digital arts and visual arts wings and getting cross content between all of these different types of programs the way they are in the real world. Uh, the, that wing is also then anchored by the science uh, component and the remainder of the loop uh, fi is filled out by general ed and special education programs. Moving upstairs to the third floor, we follow the same philosophy of the loop circulation, collaborative learning areas, as well as all of the, the classroom and, and uh, learning spaces arranged around that loop um, and organized around that loop on the third floor. 
moving up to the top floor uh, is intentionally located in just the southeast corner of the building. We're trying to keep this volume as far away, the high volume of the top floor of our building from the historic so that our project doesn't overwhelm the scale of that historic uh, piece. And at the pinnacle of the building, at the top floor, we have an opportunity to really highlight a special program here, and that is the Magnet Law and Public Policy Program. And this program includes a series of classrooms, resource spaces, and even a, a classroom that is set up as a courtroom so that students can really operate in an environment like they're eventually going to be in when they matriculate to college, grad school, law school, what have you, and move into a long public policy role in their career. So a real career option uh, for kids. And it's a highly touted and appreciated program at Towson High School. Um, looking at the project three dimensionally uh, and seeing how it really will will appear and work, um, we'll start with Cedar Avenue. And you can see here uh, that you don't really feel the, the massive addition that we're adding to the back of the school. And you really appreciate the historic nature of the building. And you don't really feel that addition until you come around to the service drive as it occurs behind. And the reason for that is that topography that I had mentioned before. Uh, you see as we're coming around the building that the largest volume of the project is built into the lowest top topographic area of the site and then connected by that elevated classroom wing uh, to that historic bar uh, on the west side facing Cedar Avenue. And by doing so, we're able to minimize the scale of this new addition from the historic side of the project. As we come around to the front, we see an elevation that is inspired by the historic, but definitely modern in its architecture. Uh, the tower draws you in and it, it harkens back to the tower on the historic facade. And as we start to rise up in elevation here, we can see the, the bus loop, which is completely separate from the parent drop off and parking area, as well as the public pedestrian pathways, which connect all the programs of the building. The that public walkway promenade also focuses on that front door. You should always know exactly where you're going. Um, and so that was an intentional architectural feature that we that we focused on. Um, whenever we deal with a project that's vertical in nature, we do drawings other than just floor plans. We do a drawing called a section where we cut through the building from the side from the side and look into it. And here you can see one such section, seeing how students entering that lobby can very quickly be dispersed vertically in the building. Um, as we come around to the south side of the building, some other sections start to really unveil the strategy of the design and how it fit into the topography of the site. <laughs> As we cut this next section, we can see on the bottom right how the large volume spaces, the gym and the student commons, are built down into the lowest area of the site. And then the elevated classroom wing connects that new bar to the historic bar on the left. Here in this section, you can see how three stories of classroom space can then be stacked on top of those large volume spaces, maximizing the footprint of the building by going vertical. And last but not least, on the left side, you can see the large volume career technology education programs directly adjacent to three stories of historic classrooms, which are much shorter and smaller in scale, getting the right kinds of interactions, but still the right volumes of spaces. And again, as we come across the front of the building, we've tried our best to respect the historic rules of the of the architecture uh, of the historic building while definitively making a modern contemporary building for next generation learning. Our last challenge of the project was to design it in a way that it could be phased and constructed in a phased while occupied manner. And while the construction management team is working on the actual schedule and the details of the phasing, the design itself is designed to lend itself uh, to that process. Uh, what we have before us is the existing current um, massing of the building. And the first step in the process will be to replace the kinds of spaces that we cannot accommodate in temporary facilities like portables or modular buildings. And those are the gymnasium, the uh, media center spaces, the, the student commons, the learning commons, and the science labs, things that aren't easily addressed in temporary facilities. And those would all be built new in the first phase, along with a, as much additional classroom capacity as we can add in that phase. Once we have those spaces uh, accommodated and occupied, we can then demolish the existing cafeteria and gymnasium and replace that with the new theater expansion, the new administration, and renovate the, the existing theater uh, to the state-of-the-art modern theater. Uh, with the capacity we have in place now and students actually occupying those new spaces, we can now start to address the existing building by creating that 
elevated classroom connector, renovating the west side of the building. And once that's complete, we can move to and renovate the north wing of the building, completing that educational loop. And finally, that would result in a new and historic Towson High School uh, for the community. So ultimately, the new Towson High School will respect its historic legacy while simultaneously being designed for next generation learning. It will accommodate the capacity that we're seeking to achieve uh, in student capacity. It will be designed to be safe and secure. It will be sustainable not only during its construction process, but also sustainable in perpetuity in its operation with mechanical systems uh, and such put in place appropriately. We're maximizing the site by minimizing the footprint and going vertical with the building. And we have a plan in place that we feel will be safely constructed while occupied. And with that, I thank you for your attention and opportunity to work with you and staff on this project. It's been very exciting so far, and uh, we're happy to take any comments or input that you might be able to offer. Are there any questions or is there any discussion? Yes, Ms. Harvey. Ms. Harvey, I have a question. Rod McMillian. I, I, I heard Ms. Hen first and then Mr. It, McMillian. Mr. McMillian, okay, go ahead of me. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Go ahead, ahead Ms. Hen. Um, thank you, and thank you for this presentation. This, this is quite the beautiful design. I just want to say first, um, I'm my jaw's kind of on the floor here, just admiring what you've done with um, preserving the historic facade and um, incorporating the modern pieces of this. It it really looks seamless, and I applaud the designers and and the effort that was made. So my first observation is wow. <laughs> so thank you very much um, for that. I do have a couple of um, questions. I'll try to be brief. Um, my first is, do you know what the um, new parking capacity will be as compared to the current? It looks to be new by the it presentation. Is. We, we are targeting a slight, a slight increase compared to new, I believe. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I may misquote this, the, the exact number, but we're looking at a 278 which is a slight increase. I will share with you that we've continued working in design uh, with your traffic teams, uh, and we are looking at ways of maximizing and, and also maximizing safety on the site uh, and the circulation patterns. So that is a process that is continuing, but we are looking at a slight increase currently. Okay, because one, one concern with the shift of the entrance for evening activities um, is there, there currently are fewer parking spots in that lower area than currently. So I'm curious as to how that will be. Oh, excellent question. Uh, one, one opportunity we have there is also to double strike the bus, bus loop for evening activity parking, uh, which will be a, a significant increase from what the capacity is currently. Okay, thank you. And my <laughs> second question has to do with the gym. Um, should that be used for um, after school activities and evening access? It didn't appear that that was part of the isolated wing when you were describing the um, area adjacent or behind the admin mm -hmm. section. Yeah, I'm sorry. I may have moved a, a bit quicker than I should have. Uh, we are able to isolate that wing, uh, okay. have evening entrance uh, <clears throat> without providing access, without allowing access to the remainder <clears throat> of the building. Perfect. And and last last question. I could keep you here all day, but no, that's fine. Um, I'll limit it. it. Is the cafeteria seating capacity? Because I know the current facility, they're quite limited as compared to enrollment. And um, I the student commons area looks great. I'm I'm wondering what the capacity numbers look like. So for cafeteria. I believe the EdSpec is intended to maximize three lunch periods for the entire capacity of the school. So that would be a factor of 1720 over three. Okay, so that that's seven, quite a large space then if the yes. capacity is 17, okay. Or divide that by three, okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I don't know the exact numbers, I apologize. No worries, three three seems more than reasonable. I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Ms. Harvey and Mr. McMillian. Thank you, uh, Ms. Hen, Mr. McMillian. Yes, yeah, so the student commons area is your cafeteria. Is that That's correct? That's correct, sir. Yes, sir. Where are the the actual kitchen? Where's the kitchen? 
location located? Sorry, directly adjacent. Uh, and this is the service drop off and wing, uh, mechanical electrical spaces, all the deliveries are coming in back through here. Uh, this is the kitchen, which then just serves the student commons directly adjacent. OK, gotcha. And would you go back to one of the original slides where you showed the existing square footage versus how you've in increased that? Yes, sir. I think it was one of the first ones. Yes, there you go. So you've increased it over 100,000. Wow. Yes, sir. OK, great. Thank you very much for your help. Of course. Is there any further discussion or questions? Uh, thank you so very much for this presentation. It is a beautiful design, I must thank say. You. Uh, we're excited about what Towson will look like when it's all finished, and I'm sure the students will be happy as well, and the staff. So thank you so very much. Thank you very, very much. We really appreciate your input. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We're going to keep it moving here. Uh, so, I now call to order the meeting of the Building and Contracts Committee for Monday, June 12, 2023. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a, a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board committee members will say their names before making and seconding a motion, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Fayo or myself if you must leave the call by using the team's chat feature so that we can maintain a quorum. Ms. Faya, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Ms. Harvey? Present. Mr. Young? Present. Ms. Hen? Present. Mr. McMillian? Present. Ms. Harvey, there are four. Thank you. Ms. Faya, will you please now call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting? Thank you. Dr. Bertomas? Mr. Kevin Conley? Present. Mr. James Corns? Present. Mr. Pete Dixon? Present. Dr. Douglas Elmendorf? Ms. Kimberly Ferguson? Present. Ms. Jennifer Hernandez? Present. Ms. Heather Logman? Present. Ms. April Lewis? Present. Ms. Cassell Mishinda? Present. Mr. Jennifer Molinex? Present. Ms. Megan Shea? Present. <laughs> I couldn't unmute. Dr. Melissa Wistead? Present. Ms. Leanne Schubert? Present. Ms. Jamie Hetzler? Mr. Merrill Plate? Present. Mel Webster? Present. Mr. John Salorno? Present. Ms. Colleen Roshi? Present. If there are additional staff participating that were not mentioned, please state your name now. Hi, I'm Pedro Augusto. Thank you. Cameron Williams. Chris Hartlove. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Faye. We're going to jump right in our first contract. And for that, I'm going to call on Mr. Hartlove. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Our first contract is ASI-819-21 Mathematics Grade 6 through Algebra 2 program. This contract modification will provide for the continued phase of Grade 6 through Algebra 2 supplies and services. Approval is requested to increase contract spending authority by 2.1 million, bringing the total revised contract spending authority to $5,207,623. Uh, and the uh, which uh, these materials were approved at uh, curriculum committee on April 27th, 2023. Are there any questions? OK, we will proceed to the next contract. And for that, I call on Mr. Hartlow. Sure, and as you heard in the introduction, we have plenty of staff here to answer your questions, so don't hesitate. CWA-133-20, third party world language languages assessment. This contract modification will provide for continued third party world languages assessments. Approval is requested to increase contract spending authority by $600,000, bringing the revised total contract spending authority to $1,200,000. Uh, these were also approved. Uh, they were also discussed at the curriculum committee on April 27, 2023. Are there any questions? Ms. Harvey, I have one. Ms. Hen, please proceed. Thank you. Um, could we receive some more detail about the use of these assessments and the value to our students um, in these world language course? Are they used for placement? Are they used for progress checks? Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, Thank so you. I'll, I'll start and then um, Ms. Hernandez can jump in. So um, the, the primary use case is for we use the Apple assessment um, in grade seven in the spring of seventh grade for precisely what you just talked about so that our students can have a measure of progress towards proficiency at the end of the world language courses that they take in grade six and grade seven um, for the fall of eighth grade when they're making that uh, scheduling recommendation for high school placement. So our goal is to have our students meet sufficient proficiency after our middle school grade so that they can enter high school at level three of their world language of study. Um, and so that's the primary role is to use for both a um, measure of progress towards proficiency and for placement in the high school. And so then in the fall of eighth grade, our world languages teachers have a model of in the four domains of language, what are relative strengths and needs for students so that they can really be very strategic um, and helping students meet those levels of proficiency for placement. The other use case, which is a part of the driver that we're excited about the increased opportunity, is that our high school students can also use these assessments to demonstrate proficiency and earn the seal of biliteracy. So the Maryland Seal of Biliteracy is a statewide initiative um, to help demonstrate that our students have mastered both proficiency in English as measured by our state assessments, but also um, met proficiency, a high level of proficiency, um, to, to earn that designation of being biliterate, which of course we know is when you use the perfect phrase value add for our graduates, um, both for college and career readiness, but then certainly in this um, global environment. Um, so our high school students, we're seeing a significant increase in our high schools offering this as an assessment. They can also earn the seal through courses, I mean, through passing things like an AP or IB exam, um, but the Apple is a more broad assessment that allows a lot of students to um, demonstrate this proficiency on a number of languages to earn that seal. Um, and then most recently, we've been using it for our multilingual learners. Um, and that's a part of our Spanish for Native and Heritage Speakers course is some of our students who come in, now we're using it as a way to demonstrate proficiency in their L1 so that then when they also master um, English 10, they too can earn the seal of biliteracy by furthering their literacy in their um, L1. So, Mr. Hernandez, anything I left out that you want to add? 
That was great. I would just add that it's a research um, supported assessment that is supported by ACTFL, which is our National World Languages Organization, um, and that um, the assessment results provide a diagnostic report also for the students. So teachers can also review that diagnostic report, look at student development across the four domains of language. So look very closely at speaking, listening, reading, and writing, and then support some additional scaffolds that might be needed. And also as a result of using the Apple, we have a couple students who have earned triple seals of biliteracy this year, which is super exciting. Um, and we've had a group of Latin students also take this assessment um, for Latin, it's called the Alira. And we have so far 66 um, high school Latin students and we're still receiving test results, um, but they've already achieved using this particular assessment. So they will also be earning a seal of biliteracy. Thank, thank you for that information. Um, I appreciate it. My, my question is, what is the value add of using a third party tool over our educators making those assessments themselves in house? We have amazing world language teachers who have been doing this prior to this tool being available. They've been recommending placements for high school. We've had students earn these seals. Um, this is not something new. We're we're well experienced in educating our students in world language and those educators have been assessing proficiency. Um, they're with the students every day. Are we saying what is the value add or what is the need for this third party tool over what our educators can provide? Thank sure. you. Sure. If I may, Ms. Hen, thank you. Um, and Jen and Megan, I'll try to um, add. I'm sure you two can add more than I can. Um, Ms. Hen, just for perspective, this is the national assessment that um, provides professional credentialing for students to have um, biliteracy. So for example, any of our world language teachers, as part of their teacher certification, they have to pass uh, this exam at a certain level in order to meet their professional credential as a world language teacher. So this is, uh, in many ways, very comparable to our credentialing programs in CTE uh, areas of study. It's just this is a language um, professional language exam. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to Ms. Hernandez, who's uh, much more of an expert than I am, but I just wanted to offer that perspective. Thank you. That's correct. And also um, the other benefit to this particular assessment is that um, the domains are scored, the speaking, listening, reading, and writing domains are scored by professionally trained assessors um, who are experts in the field. So it is truly um, what can students do with the language that is beyond the scope of what we might assess in a classroom. So the topics, the concepts, it's all really how can students produce language, which is sometimes different than the types of assessments that we would provide in a classroom setting. And these assessments also can be used, um, as Dr. McComas said, a teacher needs to earn an intermediate high to teach in the state of Maryland. That is actually the same level um, that this particular assessment uses um, to qualify students for the seal of biliteracy. And it's also an assessment that is uh, further supported by MSDE as a recommended assessment um, for third party expertise in terms of assessing student proficiency across language. Thank you. So it certainly seems robust. And my my final question is, do we have an equivalent for English proficiency? Because <laughs> and I see you laughing. I, I mean that in all seriousness, because obviously there's room to improve and it seems like such a diagnostic tool would be extremely useful for ELA proficiency. And unless yeah. I don't am not aware of one, it doesn't seem like we are. No, so uh, Ms. Hen, you we're smiling because you've raised a really good point, and it was actually what I was going to share as a parallel for the value add of having a robust nationally normed two levels of proficiency assessment. I'm not aware of one currently for um, our students that measures the four domains in the way that Apple does. So of course, from the seal of biliteracy, they use the ELA 10 MCAP as that version of what makes a student biliterate, but to your point, it does not measure all four domains of language, including that listening and speaking. It only measures the two, um, reading and writing. So um, I, I wouldn't be opposed to, to have something like that developed. I'm not aware of one, um, but I think the the idea here with Apple in particular is that you're right. Prior, we did have teachers that were assessing from the curriculum and making those recommendations, but they were not normed against this national standard of proficiency. And when we think about college and career readiness, 
we actually, as much as we do, of course, invest in and trust in our teachers, we also want our teachers to feel confident that their uh, recommendation is aligned to those national norms for proficiency that are so that our students are deemed uh, successful across any you know school, whether they pursue it in higher education or even as part of their career. Um, I would love to to learn of, of one that does that for English. I'm not aware of one currently. And as it's required for graduation, and as we know, we have students who are falling quite short of our their proficiency goals in English. I would hope that that would be a priority um, for the school system. Thank you. Absolutely. Back to Thank you. Do we have any other questions regarding this contract? Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlove. Yes, uh, CWA-123-23 textbooks and instructional materials. This is a new competitively bid contract for textbooks and instructional materials. Approval was requested for a five year contract with 13 recommended bidders and contract spending authority of 13 million. This was also uh, discussed at the curriculum committee on um, April 17th. Uh, various departments within curriculum and instruction have made 70% of the purchases from the previous contract. These purchases include materials to support magnet, uh, CTE and Title I schools, materials purchased to support the virtual school program and additional quantities of previously adopted materials to support changing student populations. School purchases account for 28% of the purchases and 2% of the purchases were made by central offices outside of curriculum and instruction to support professional development for staff. Are there any questions or discussion? I have one, Ms. Harvey. Uh, please proceed, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, so this is a new contract. This replaces the current contract for purchasing these materials. Can someone elaborate on Correct. on that? That's not much of an elaboration. So maybe somebody from one. <laughs> yeah, I know it replaces one, but I, uh, someone else can maybe fill in some of the details. So I'm curious as to why this is needed over the the previous one, and what is changed. Ms. Webster, if you want to go first. This is, re yes, thank you. Uh, Ms. Hen, this is replacing a contract that is getting ready to expire. And this is something that is used that is separate from all of the individual adoptions that we bring forward. These are, te these are textbooks and novels that are used as supplemental material for the most part. Um, we do use it sometimes to buy additional copies of things. Um, so that we continue to use it heavily. May I add something that might answer Ms. Hen's question? Um, so Ms. Hen, instead of just using the old one or renewing it, by doing it, we were able to open up and add additional titles that could be a part. There's over 5,000 titles and materials that then benefit from this competitive pricing. And by going through the process of a new contract, we were able to open it up again, if you will, so that that list could be added to or changed to reflect where we are and what schools most need or what Title I offices need. Um, so it just gave us an opportunity to ensure that we were getting the best vendors with the titles that we need in schools um, at that competitive price rather than just renewing what was there. It gave us a chance to open it up. OK, thank you for that, Ms. Shea. And, and that <laughs> leads to another question, but that helps um, clarify sure. it. So thank you for that explanation. We The board receives um, requests to approve modifications routinely for additional vendors, additional spending authority. Um, the contract terms change for an extension. Why, and maybe Ms. Webster, this is a question for you. Yeah. Why was a new contract needed in this case? The prior contract did not have any extension periods left. So we issued a new, we, we asked curriculum and instruction to update the list of materials that were part of this contract. And then we issued a new solicitation um, as per normal practice. Okay, thank you. Does the new contract have extension options? It does not. It is a five-year contract. Okay, thank you. That's all, Ms. Harvey. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Hearing none, we shall proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlove. Thank you. 
NGO-412-23 International Baccalaureate Program. This is a new sole source contract with the International Baccalaureate IB Program um, for seven um, IB schools. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with the option for one five-year extension with one recommended bidder and a contract spending authority of 1.8 million. Are there any questions or discussion? What schools are we identifying here again? The seven IB schools? I believe there seven are IB schools. Oh, sorry. No, <laughs> sorry, that's right. Um, thank you, that's a great question. The seven IB schools are Wellwood International and Woodmore are the, are the primary years programs. Kenwood High School and Newtown High School are Diploma programs, Newtown High School is a career related program, and the middle years programs include Middle River Middle, Stemmers Run, Windsor Mill, Penwood, and Newtown. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any further questions? Hearing none, moving on to the next contract, Mr. Hartlove. And I always learn to let the experts answer. Um, GDA 321 23, Clinical Staff health services. This is a new cooperative administration of programs contract for the joint administration of school health services. Approval is requested for a five year contract with the option uh, for a five year extension and contract spending authority of 2.5 million. Under this MOU, the Baltimore County Department of Health and BCPS jointly operate clinics in selected schools to support expanded nurse practitioner services to students without access to primary health care. Are there any questions? Yes, Ms. Harvey, I have some. Please proceed, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, which schools are served by these um, new school health services? believe we have. Yes, this is Kim Ferguson. I'm on the line. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson. Hi, Dr. Ferguson. Hi. Uh, give me a second. I'm going to pull up the schools for you that um, that have. This is for current school health centers, so that's it's not okay. school. It's not it's now current. Yeah, these are the new schools. It's just a. Um, we have to update the the contract with the health department to keep the you know, keep our nurse practitioners hired in those schools. So I'll give you that list in a second. Give me a second. Things are moving slow. Just when I need to move them fast. And I apologize, my camera is not working. I am still upside down. I'll get it fixed. <laughs> I don't want you to see me upside down. All righty. All righty, so the wellness centers, are in we have wellness centers in um elementary schools so the elementary schools served by school-based wellness centers are dundalk elementary hawthorne elementary riverview elementary um, sandalwood elementary is served through deep creek middle schools wellness center and norwood elementary school is served by hollabird wellness center so at the middle school level in addition to deep creek and hollabird we have lansdowne middle Dundalk Middle, which is served by Dundalk, Dundalk High, and Middle River Middle. And then as far as our high schools, we have wellness centers at Chesapeake, Dundalk High again, Kenwood High, Lansdowne High, Owens Mills High, Parkville High, and Woodlawn High. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> and our exhibit indicates that 70% of funding is through grants. Yes. Um, Mr. Hartlove, perhaps you could uh, expand or elaborate on the source, the grant funding. Um, actually, I'd ask, ask Ms. Uh, Webster if she has the details of that, and if not, we'll follow up with you. Mr. Hartlove, we will need to follow up on that. Okay, yeah, I, I don't know it off the top of my head, but I will, I can get that information and follow up. Do you know whether those are um, ESSER funds? By chance, I don't believe they are. Um, but we can we can verify, uh, but I don't believe they are ESSER funds. 
these are, I believe, ongoing grants, but let me let me verify. OK, and my final question is um, in this 2.5 million spending authority, does does that include plans to expand or is that adequate funding for expansion of services to additional schools or is that the? The planned um, expenditures needed for the existing schools through 2028. Because I believe we're expanding. Health service health services to additional schools. Dr. So Ferguson would right. So this is for the current schools. The current schools, mm -hmm. the current wellness centers where we, we are looking to expand, but right now the funding that we're requesting is for um, our current uh, school based um, wellness centers. Through 2028. So our annual um, cost then because we go from a, a prior fiscal year annual expenditures of 140,000 to the anticipated um, fiscal year annual of 500,000. So can you speak to that? that increase then in what we expect to spend for the next five years. If we're not servicing additional schools, that's. I believe it's additional schools it's over the prior contract, but it's not additional schools. I I understood your question is expanding the schools that are in here um, and it doesn't allow for expansion beyond what's in here, but this is an expansion over the previous contract, I believe, is that is that the case, Ms. Webster, or Dr. Ferguson? I so there, to click the go ahead. Right. So there are two pots of funds. Um, so there are grant funds and there are operating funds. Um, so the grant funds support nurse practitioners in several schools, and then the operating funds also um, support the vision, hearing, screening, dental sealing, and certain medications, as well as uh, one nurse practitioner. And that, so that is, that's yearly. So we're looking at grant funds supporting um, for fiscal year 24, that's on over 265,000 for grant. And then for operating, it's one, it's oh, almost 150,000, no, actually, it's 150,000 for the nursing program and then a, almost 119,000 for the nurse practitioner. That's that's yearly. OK, I'm, I'm looking at the the overall um, the total for all pots when the prior fiscal year actuals are estimated to increase by almost threefold or a little over threefold um, starting next year. Right, and, and I'm asking and, about why there's an Right. It, it yes, and I appreciate your question. I think the problem is, is that we have a lag in the, the billing from the health department, so it doesn't show the expenditures as they really are. OK, so we are you're saying that the the act, the actual actuals are closer to. The 500,000 yes. that's anticipated for moving ahead. Yes. OK. Mr. Harlove, if the board could could receive confirmation of of that. Sure, for, for that's, well, that'd we, be great. We can uh, we can do that. Make a note here for the current actuals. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. You're welcome. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlove. Yes, LKO-400-19 electronic health records EHR software for pre-K to 12. This contract modification will provide for the continued use of electronic health record software for the Office of Health Services. Approval is requested to extend the contract for five months and increase contract spending authority by $75,000, bringing the revised Total contract spending authority to one million three hundred and fourteen thousand dollars with one awarded contractor. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlove. Sure. Um, DEI-606-23 student growth and achievement uh, assessment. This is a new cooperative contract for measure of academic 
progress map growth, which provides norm referenced growth and achievement data for students in kindergarten through grade eight in reading and math. Approval is requested for, and this is there's a there's an error, I believe. It's actually for a 14 month contract uh, with four one year extensions, one recommended bidder, and contract spending authority of 845,000. So the notes say 10 month. It's actually a four. If you look at the the date is correct, the end date of August 16th, 2024. The note is uh, should be changed from 10 to 14 months. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlow. DEI-609-23 College Board Assessments and Support. This is a new sole source contract to provide the PSAT 8-9 to all uh, grade nine students. The PSAT-NMSQT to all grade 10 and 11 students, uh, and then the SAT to all grade 11 students, advanced placement uh, student test and AP teacher workshops. Approval is requested for a five year contract with a five year extension with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $10 million. Uh, this was also approved at the curriculum committee on May 18th. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the next contract. CWA-116-23, Technology Support Staffing Services. Uh, this is a contract modification to add one vendor to the list of 27 approved awardees. The vendor was inadvertently omitted from the original exhibit approved by the board on Tuesday, April 18th, 2023. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the next contract, Mr. Hartla. CWA-122-23 Information Technology Staffing Services. This is a new competitively bid contract for information technology staffing services. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with 60 recommended bidders and contract spending authority of 25 million. Are there any questions? I have one, Ms. Harvey. Ms. Hen, please proceed. Thank you. Um, the lifetime prior contract expenditures on this contract were 16 mm -hmm. million. Um, what's recommended is an increase, 9 million, I believe. Is that right, Mr. Hartlove? Sorry, I'm just making sure I have my numbers here correct. 9 million ab above the actual, okay. the prior contract spend. Above the prior contract spend. So if, could someone speak, perhaps Mr. Augusto could speak to the increase over prior year and how these well, services will be used? Sure. Um, good afternoon. Good evening, Ms. Hen. Evening. How are you today? I'm um, well. Um, so yeah, so what we are anticipating, so th again, this is um, spending authority. Again, it's all dependent on the budget. Um, beginning um, or our expected award for the new ERP implementation vendor and software is expected in um sometime after july so it'll be in in the summer here um so for the next uh years we do anticipate um and we're support or expecting ramp up of um, highly skilled it professionals to support that in addition to the integrator um, for ongoing support for that system um, the implementation and then we also um have um, the ability to bring in additional um professional it professional staff for um additional projects within um, doit for example if we're doing any stopgap measures until the erp system is fully operational because we will for a period of time be running two systems as we stagger uh, the implementation from business uh, business function to business function. Um, we will have the need to um, put in some of the stopgap measures for automation of certain functions. We're doing that today 
um, and we expect to do that within the next two years as we fully implement the ERP system. So this is the ability for us to be able to quickly move and bring in um, IT professional staff where we need it to support ERP and other search projects. Uh, and Ms. Hen, um, just to follow up, I looked at the prior contract and it was uh, spending authority on that was 21,225,000. So, um, so it's it's a smaller increase. Oh, it's still a, a large increase, but it's a smaller increase. Um, yeah. If you look, if you look, spending authority to spending authority. And that is, and, and, and actually, um, that also what I spoke to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, were the um, the needs that DIT would have the support needs for the period of performance. Um, there's also this contract is also used by draw for. Um, their their professional uh, skill skilled staff that um, they also leverage. So um, this is not just for DIT. It, it it is a contract that can be used across the board. Do do you expect a decrease in those expenditures once ERP is fully implemented? Are these one time? Yeah. So this this will be search. Uh, yes, because part of what um, I'll be doing because um, we anticipate so. Uh, the industry standard right now, the typical ERP system implementation runs in between 24 to 36 months, and it is typically done in a staged fashion where you'll take, you know, back office functions such as payroll and finance at a certain time. HR will be done also then along a staggered approach. Um, there will be a period of time where we're going to have the supplemental staff, and then while we're doing that, uh, we'll be looking at also uh, training our existing staff um, in whatever system will be used, um, doing a skill set analysis just to make sure if we need to bring in additional FTEs, and then also balance that with ongoing um, contract IT support. Thank you. Um, ERP implementation is my um, pet <laughs> love, so I will. I could talk to you about that for for at length, but the board yep. may be interested in a presentation on that at some point because it, as you mentioned, it touches every area of operations, yep. and because it is a multi-year initiative, we we've, we've discussed this at budget committee. Um, that committee would like a better understanding of our our expenditures, what what to expect, and as we look forward in future budgets, um, what to anticipate. So thank you yeah, for that I, information. I, sure, sure, Ms. Hen. And I think that's actually, you know, obviously that is something that we can look at post contract award because, um, you know, we, we don't know who the vendor is going to be yet. We don't know who the integrator is going to be. Um, once that is done and once we talk to the integrator and get a good feel for what the implementation implementation timeline is going to be, I think uh, at that point we'll be ready to, uh, to give a presentation to the board. Look forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Gusto. Thank You're you. Ms. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, we'll move on to the next contract. Mr. Hartlow. MBU-534-19 promotional items. This contract modification will provide for the continued purchase of promotional items for all BCPS schools and offices. Approval is requested to increase contract spending authority by $650,000, bringing the revised total contract spending authority to 1.3 million with six awarded contractors. So I just have a quick question. Why are we needing to double the amount that we're asking for for promotional items. When and when you say promotional items, do you mean things like pens and mugs and t-shirts and those kinds of things? Am I understanding this to be what we're talking about here? That's a good Hart general understanding, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Webster. No, that's okay. Uh, Ms. Harvey, with the exception of the t-shirts, this this contract does not cover any clothing. This is simply the the lanyards that we use, pens, pencils, and other things. Um, some of it is used by HR during their marketing efforts. Um, 
some of it is used by my office during our marketing efforts, but the, the vast majority of the spend comes from the actual schools. Um, the spend authority that we are requesting is consistent with the, um, the spend that has been made by the schools over the past several years. So we start out with an initial 650,000 as a spending authority. Are you saying that in previous years we've modified that as well? We, when we started this contract back in 2019, we requested 500,000 for the life of a five-year contract. And based on usage of the contract, we have brought it back once already, um, adding an, an additional 150,000, believing that that would be sufficient, um, only to decide that it wasn't sufficient and needed to come back again to support the purchases that are being made. Okay, uh, thank you. Are there any further questions? Ms. Harvey, I have I have a couple on this one. Absolutely, Mr. McMillian, please proceed. OK, one of the questions was the 650, but obviously that was answered. Uh, help me help me through this. Help me understand this, please. Uh, and I'm just going to throw out some guesses and then you tell me whether I'm right or wrong. We've got 176 schools. We've got you know dozens of offices. If they have money in their operating budget, the leaders of those different organizations can reach out to one of these vendors and you know make arrangements to buy some of their promotional items is that, that is, correct that is yes, correct sir. and uh and mr mcmillian i would add one of the fund sources is also uh school funds um which is a large which is a large um provider of the dollars as well you know the dollars that schools have outside of their operating budget for things like machine uh, 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 commissions and um, uh, picture commissions and those types of things. Those dollars that they have could be used for these items as well. Okay, so then they reach out and, and make arrangements through these vendors to buy their products. And then, so that, whatever that fee is, where is that subtracted? Now, See, that's the confusing part to me because you talk about those funds and you talk about the operating budget, and now we're talking about this bigger pot of money. Where it is, how does that subtracted, you know, out of this, the current financial, so the current financials budgeted $346,000. The expenditures are 133, which I don't thoroughly understand, but so it's subtracted from that the current contract expenditures. Is that correct? The current contract expenditures are actual expenditures and um, um, the, the school funding is not a budgeted amount. They don't budget that in with their general operating dollars. The, that's a, a more of a revolving account where they have these dollars that are available to them to be used um, for things in particular morale types of items is is what we try to direct them to utilize those funds for versus the general operating dollars we try to use those more for instructional supplies and materials and less for these types of items okay so they wouldn't be reflected in this when i'm looking at fiscal year to date contract expenditures eighty nine thousand dollars so if a school they, use local if a school use local school funds that that's not going to be represented. That that cost is not going to be represented in this eighty nine thousand dollars. Is that correct? That I'm not sure, Ms. Webster. I don't know if you know the answer to that or not. If if the school is using student activity funds, which I believe is what you're referring to, Mr. Hartlove, right? That is correct. They are not represented in these numbers. Okay, so out of 176 schools and they're encouraged to use student activity funds for these purchases. So are we saying then that most of the expenditures are coming from the offices? 
No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I can't. I I don't have the breakdown of office versus um, school available at this moment. It is something I can can get easily. Um, but the majority of these. I'm just trying to understand this process. That's all. Right. I'm not trying sure. to be difficult. I'm just trying to understand. No. The majority okay. of these funds are coming from the schools. The um, from the schools operating budgets. OK, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Are there any further questions? I have a general one, Ms. Harvey, if I may. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, so it was it was shared with the board recently that schools can enter into contracts on their own outside of central um, a centralized contract for purchasing things such as um, or entering into a contract with um, a school photographer, for instance. Can someone explain um, to the committee which um, serve products or services schools are permitted to enter into their own contracts directly versus purchasing under a centralized contract such as this? Because it seems that there's, what is the, the rhyme or reason or rationale? So Ms. Hen, before they answer, I, I wonder if we might add that as an agenda item so that, that the team can have time to compile the information and perhaps present it to the contract committee so that we have a full uh, explanation as to your question so that we can uh, discuss that in length? Sure. I, I just thought if it was an, an easy answer and there was a rule or um, dictating that, I, I can look it up on my own time. I don't want to waste anyone's No, it's time. absolutely it's not a waste of time. Absolutely. I just want to make sure that if it's not um, a, a, a quick and easy answer that sure. we're getting the full picture. I, sure. I think Ms. Webster can want a quick. I think she can give you a quick one. Go ahead. I I do know that there is a superintendent's rule for this, but unfortunately, I don't know the number. No worries of that rule. So, um, I can I can look that that piece up or and provide additional detail at a later point in time if desired. No what? worries. Do we know what, what that rule is by product or service? And Mr. Hartlove, sorry, you're you're trying to chime in no. here. I believe I, it's it's pretty detailed. Right. The only thing I was going to add is that the pictures um, are paid for by parents. So the school's not really paying for pictures versus, um, you know, if, if a school is buying um, mugs and, and, and um, other types of items, they are actually buying those. So that's why we bid those out versus the pictures. Um, are not really being paid for from school funds. They're being paid for by parents. So anything paid for by school funds needs to be um, procured through, and this is a question for Ms. Webster, through a central um, vehicle such as this contract? Over a certain dollar amount, right? I it's tied to dollar amount. OK. I, I believe so. I, I'd really rather check than just give a spot quick answer. Go ahead. Ms. Harvey, can I add something to this? Absolutely, Mr. McMillian. OK, let's you, you just said that the families are buying the pictures. OK, how about the kid that buys the dollar or the two dollar soda out of the soda machine? Those those are now at one time, you know, that respective individual schools work those deals out because I was involved in that. But now, if I'm not mistaken, those are it's a centralized contract that goes through, you know, BCPS. Is that correct? The the vending machines in the cafeterias are under contract through Food and Nutrition Services, and the food that is uh, food and beverages that are offered through those machines meet the nutrition standards um, for Food and Nutrition Services. The vending machine out in the hallway is still done by the school. So the vending machines and the soda machines are controlled by the school. The ones not in the lunchroom. 
Right. So, so if the lunchroom closes at 1230 or whatever, and there's a machine in the hallway after the cafeteria closes, those machines are the individual respective schools can contract, can negotiate those own deals. Yes. Thank you. Yep. So I'm going to close discussion on this particular contract because we broadened the discussion. I think it's a worthwhile discussion for us to have, but I really would like the BCPS team to prepare something for us to go through those particular nuances so that we understand when contracts are centralized and when they're not to Ms. Hens. Uh, question into Mr. McMillian's question. Are there any further questions on this contract? Hearing none, we'll move on to the next contract. Mr. Hartlove. NGO-403-23 Active Assailant Training. This is a new competitively bid contract to provide access to online training for all BCPS staff members to prepare them to respond to an active assailant event. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of 380,000, 300, I'm sorry, $340,800. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlow. CWA-118-23 online courses for continuing professional development or graduate credit credits. Uh, this is a new competitively bid contract for online courses for continuing professional development or graduate credits. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $830,000. And that, and that uh, award is going to uh, Notre Dame of Maryland. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlove. JBO-723-18 Beverages and Vending Machines. This contract modification provides for purchase of beverages for the Office of Food and Nutrition Services. Approvals requested to extend the contract for one year with one awarded vendor. And the total, the total, uh, oh, this is just an extension. Yeah, the, to the uh, spending authority stays the same. Are there any questions? Ms. Harvey? Mr. McMillian, please. please proceed. Yeah, and I won't be long on this. Uh, something that stood out to me. Now I've got the wrong, hold on just a second. I'm sorry, I had this, I'm sorry. Was that if if we scroll down to the second green box, the prior fiscal year actuals were fifteen thousand dollars, and the current fiscal year budgeted is six hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. That just seems out of whack to me. Uh, can somebody explain that? Uh, yes, Mr. McMillian, I can I can try to explain that for you. Um, we did not have what you would call a, a normal cafeteria service in the previous fiscal year. So we did not uh, sell any kind of beverages or snacks a la carte. So that's the reason for the low uh, annual spend for that particular fiscal year. Um, we have started this, uh, this particular school year, school year 23, uh, back to that, if you will, uh, quote unquote, normal uh, model of service. And so, uh, in order to purchase those products, uh, we had to spend that type of funds in order to sell to the to the students. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the next contract. And for that, I call on Mr. Dixit. Uh, good evening again. The next contract is MBU-522-17 for custodial contract cleaning. The request for your approval is to increase the spending authority by $4,150,000, bringing the revised total to $9,702,500. The, the rationale for request is to continue to provide services in spite of a large number of vacancies we have. 
Are there any questions? Ms. Harvey, I have one. Please proceed, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Dixit. Good evening. Um, could you please elaborate for the committee um, the need for um, such an increase in spending authority? I noticed that the um, terms of this request have not changed. The end date's the same, ends in 27, um, as compared to what was originally requested. You, you mentioned vacancies. Um, however, we're looking at more than a, a two-fold increase in what was originally requested. Could you speak to that, sir? So, uh, absolutely. So, okay. when we originally asked for board's approval for a five-year contract, there was a certain amount of vacancies and dollars that we anticipated. Uh, those vacancy, and we were hoping that we will be able to fill more and more vacancies and not depending on the contractual services. As time goes along, we find that our vacancies are still at that level uh, uh, that we had before, and they are not decreasing. We continue to work with HR to reduce those vacancies, but the annual expenditure that we are pro projecting here is four million hundred fifty thousand dollars for this fiscal year, and the last year that we spent was. Uh, uh, was so uh, current fis fiscal year last year we spent was three million six hundred and sixty thousand. So the rate of expenditure is more than what we had anticipated before because we have not been able to fill the vacancies. Uh, if we are able to fill the vacancies, this, then this amount will not be needed in future years. OK, thank you for that information. Um, it's it's concerning that the board approved this just a year ago with the existing spending authority, and yeah. it's come back to us with a four point um, one million modification. Has something changed since our approval last June? Um, because clearly we saw the increase in expenditures at that time, um, or do you? Are there any other factors that are at play here, given your anticipated spend? Good question. So we requested last year based on the hope that we'll be able to fill more and more position and the expenditure rate will be less. But we, what we see that we are unable to fill more positions. Uh, so in order to provide the cleaning that is required in schools, we still need contractual help. Was it considered a um, was that one option considered to rebid this contract? Are we seeing increased um, costs? So the the rate that we are paying is pretty competitive. It is in line with what we pay to our people. Um, the risk that we have is that if you rebid in the current market environment, it can go up also. So uh, most of the contracts that we are bidding, general general impression is that the prices are going higher and not lower. So we are taking advantage of the old rates. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dixit. That's okay. all I had, Ms. Harvey. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Hen. I don't have a question. I think it's more of a comment. I, I think along the lines of Ms. Hen's questioning, you know, in order for us to be really able to make good decisions around contracts, we really want to know um, what is driving the request for the modification. Understanding that you may not spend it all or you may spend it all, but if we're going to say yes, give, you know, increase that spending, authority we really want to know what's driving that and as Ms. Hen said uh, the, the contract was just uh, up a year ago before this committee a year ago and approved before the board so if you could keep that in mind when you're responding that's helpful for us to know um, what the circumstances are that are are requiring it to come back again so thank you are there any further questions yes I have a question please proceed Mr. Young Mr. Dixit, you mentioned that um, the four million 
the expectation is that it will carry us out the four years, but is that um, number based upon assuming the current vacancies remain the same? Or I know you said you were your expectation was that HR would fill some of the current vacancies. So are you still looking for that sunny day scenario where the vacancies go down or is that four million based upon the vacancies staying the same? Good question. So what we do not want to do is ask money for the next five years or four years or the remaining term of the contract. So this four million that we are asking for your approval is for one year and we continue to make effort with the HR to fill the vacancies. If we are unable to do that, we'll come back to you sometimes next year and share with you again as to where we are and do we need additional money or not. The vacancies may go up, they may go down, the uh, the cost may go up, so we need to share. We, we need to inform the board what's going on. So this four million one hundred and fifty thousand is projected for next fiscal year additional expenditure. Thank you. I I just want to clarify one thing. I think I heard you say that the rate was competitive. When you say the rate is competitive. Are you talking about the rate that we pay our staff is competitive with what the services that we're procuring are paying? Is that, did I yes. hear that correctly? That's true. So, so what we are paying and uh, our people and what we are paying to the contractor, they are very close in terms of hourly cost. And when I say very close, it's within 10 to 20%. We want to take advantage of that because those bids were based on the market rate at the time original contract was bid. And if we bid again, more than likely, and it is dif difficult to project that cost, more than likely the price will go up. OK. Just curious as to. Uh, why we're having so much difficulty. With uh, if our if our if our pay is competitive, while we're having so much difficulty recruiting staff, but that's another conversation. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, we'll move on to the next uh, contract, Mr. Dixit. Next contract is CWA-131-23, and this is for. Wall system inspections, preventive maintenance and repair. Uh, approval is requested for a 10 month contract with options for three one year extension with one recommended bidder. The amount are, is 419,000. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the next contract, Mr. Dixit. The next contract is GDA-319-23 on-call inspection, maintenance, repair, and installation of physical education facilities and equipment. It's a five-year contract with two recommended bidders in the amount of $1,750,000. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we will proceed to the next contract. Mr. Dixit, please. So the next contract is NGO-401-23. <clears throat> Excuse me for chair lift, vertical lift, platform lift, and dumb waiter repair, preventive maintenance, new installation, supplies, and services. It's a five-year contract in the amount of $2 million. Are there any questions? Got one real quick. I've got one. Mr. McMillian, please proceed. Mr. Dixon, I've got to ask this. You, uh -huh. you know I've got to ask this. How many schools have dumb waiters at this point in time? Uh, not too many. If I remember right, there was like one or two schools with dumb waiter. But I can check that. No, the I number. That's there not necessary. I'm just curious because a dumb waiter is sort of an antiquated kind of 
thing to me. Yeah. And I'm yeah, just surprised that schools, that'd yeah, be something only, we'd still there's have. There's only one or two schools, and I can get you the exact number. I was hoping you'll ask for lifts, and there were 94 schools with lifts. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the next uh, contract. Mr. Dixon. <clears throat> next contract is NGO-411-23 for a Hereford High School tennis court resurfacing. And the amount is 648530 plus contingencies, which is 713383 Its funding source is grant, and it's uh, the lowest bidder or the only bidder is American Asphalt Paving Company. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the next contract. Mr. Dixit, please. So Ms. the Hunt, next item. Oh, Ms. I'm Hunt, sorry, Ms. Hen, did you have a question? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Before we proceed to the next item, um, I'd like to move that the committee postpone discussion on item 20 MWE 806-23, the Educational Facilities Master Plan and Comprehensive Maintenance Plan. And if there's a second, um, may I speak to my motion? Uh, I'm, so your question is not for NGO 41123? No, ma'am. Yeah, um, okay. Thank you. Before we proceed to the next one and, and Mr. Dixit presents, I move that the committee postpone uh, the next item, item 20 MWE 806-23, until such time that the comprehensive maintenance plan has been updated with the information indicated that it would be available in July. Since we are um, just a couple of weeks before July, um, the committee and board should have a complete document to review before we recommend for approval um, the comprehensive maintenance plan. And because these two documents travel together um, and one affects the other, um, I'd like the board to receive a complete um, information, specifically the facilities assessment outcomes, which the draft indicates will be available in July. So I want to Is, share with the committee. There, oh, that we I'm have sorry. A, I'm sorry, Mr. Dix, that we have a motion on the floor. Uh, First, we need to ascertain. Is there a second? I'll second it. Rod McMillian. OK, now we will have a discussion. Please, Mr. Dix, proceed. So I do want to share with the committee that educational facilities master plan is required by the state by interagency committee and with a deadline of July 1st. And there will not be meeting uh, of the board before that. And so we have to submit it on time. And this is a compliance document for participating in the state's capital improvement program. If we do not submit it on time, and the next board meeting is, uh, I believe, after July 1. So we risk uh, uh, not be being able to participate or in violation of the state's requirement. May I, may I speak to my motion, Ms. Harvey? Please, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, so the deadlines are understood. Thank you, Mr. Dixit, for, for that information. And certainly my, my objective is not to um, put that in, je jeopardize the system's um, funding from the state. However, there's a new format to the, it looks new, um, the comprehensive maintenance plan, um, specifically around facilities assessment outcomes. And this document generally contains a plan for each school, um, as is in the EFMP. And those details are not available. Um, most of the pages on, around facility outcomes indicate that the information is available July 2023 um, in the highlighted text under Section B of the CMP, Facility Outcomes, um, the Resources and Inputs section. Um, there are also several, several sections of this, but my main concern is that the facility assessment information is not, um, has not yet been updated to these documents, and I don't feel comfortable moving forward either approving or denying this without that information. And if it's if it's available, I'd rather see what's available, um, even if it's um, in draft format, then no information at all around the facilities assessment outcomes, which is what we've been provided. So I would ask that we 
um, postpone this and request, if need be, to call a special meeting to to discuss it. But um, we're we're approving kind of flying blind here without this information, which is critical to um, these two documents, which determine our um, like as you said, go to the state. The IAC relies on the information contained within, and you're right, board approval is required for that. So I would request that we postpone this. Um, the IAC is very easy to work with in, in terms of um, understanding if, if that information is still being gathered, but I, I cannot um, conscionably vote on something that's incomplete with critical information on our facilities assessments. So Thanks. I just want to share with the committee that the, these documents, they are uh, they are compliance document. They have most of the information that is in there has already been shared with the board. There is no additional new information that's coming out of any assessment that has not been shared with the board. So the same information in the format that a state requires is being submitted to them, and I do not recommend taking the risk of not participating in the, the state's capital program. So Mr. Dixon, then if I may respond, Ms. Harvey, please. Um, what information then is expected to be available in July that's not available two weeks from July? So the information that they have is, is in the flyer that's attached to this item. It shows exactly what the state requires. And for comprehensive maintenance plan, um, it's it's the it's the work order information, it's organizational units, it's planned improvement, which is included in the capital improvement program and the budget, and all of that information has already been shared with the board. So plan itself is a misnomer here for these documents. This is compiling information that you have already seen in the format that a state requires. So there is no assessment information that we are waiting for. It is just putting it all together. But the the comprehensive maintenance plan is submitted along with the educational facilities master plan. Is the, it not? These are two different documents. Yes, I I understand that, but yeah. they're both submitted by the to the state. The EFMP is due now and the CMP is due by October 15th. So perhaps I amend my, my motion and postpone half of this agenda item so that the board can approve the EFMP now considering it's due July 1st, but postpone our approval of the CMP until it's been provided with the facilities assessment information. So what I would like to add to that, that all of the information. Mr. Dix yeah. said, I'm sorry to interrupt. We have a motion okay. to amend the previous motion a second for the amendment. Thank you. I'll, I'll state, I'll restate that. So I, I move to amend my original motion to postpone or to separate item 20 and to postpone a recommendation on the CMP until the committee is provided a complete CMP. Is there a second on the amendment? I'll second it. Is there any discussion on the min amendment? May I have a roll call vote, please? Now, I thought that Mr. Dixon was going to add something there. So if Can I may. We stay for the to vote on the amendment. Yeah, so if I may, there is no new information that we'll be adding to it and whatever is submitted to state for both the document will be shared with board before submitting it to state. The only reason these two requests have been combined together is to logistically get the approval of both the documents before the timeline and so, save so coming back to one more time. Mr. Mr. Dixon, just so we're clear on the time frames, the EFMP is a July 1 deadline. Yes. That is complete gathering of information. The CMP, the Comprehensive Maintenance Plan, is due when? It's due October 15th, but October. all of the information that will be shared with them will be provided to board before October 15th. 
has all the information to be shared with them been already provided to the board? It will be provided before the timeline. But has not as it of is, today. It is being compiled as we talk. OK, uh, may I have a roll call vote? The vote is uh, there's a motion on the floor to amend uh, Ms. Hen's initial uh, motion to separate the submission of, of the approval of the master, the educational facilities master plan from the comprehensive maintenance plan, uh, specifically to uh, vote on the comprehensive maintenance plan once the facilities plan has been submitted to the board. Did I get that correct, Ms. Hen? <laughs> Very close, Ms. Harvin. <laughs> Good job. Um, it's it's to separate those as as you stated and to um, postpone approval of the CMP until staff bring a complete CMP to the committee. That's the motion. It has been seconded by Mr. McMillian. May I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Young? What's my name called? Yes. Oh, I didn't hear you. Yes. Ben? Yes. Mr. McMillian? We're having a hard time hearing you. I'm Ms. so sorry. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes and it, the amendment is adopted. May I now have a motion? No, we've got the amended motion. May I now have a roll call vote on the uh, motion as it was amended? Or is there a, yeah, no, I'm sorry. Go <laughs> ahead, proceed. <laughs> Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Mr. I'm not McMillian? sure, did she say, I'm, I'm yes. So sorry. I don't know why you can't hear me. Um, Ms. Harvey? <laughs> yes. Thank you. So, motion passes we will separate out the cmp and put before the full board for approval the educational facilities master plan to vote on the uh, comprehensive maintenance plan at a later date prior to the october 15th submission date thank you Ms. harvey you're welcome and that was the last item that i had thank you mr dixon I will Mr. now. Mr. Yes. I'd like to talk real brief. I think it was two meetings ago. Dr. Williams made the comment that we could we could adapt the template that we use for building the contracts. And based upon some questions that Ms. Dobinowski asked, we also talked in in the building or in the budget committee the other day about doing this. But then it was it was implied or might have been stated that we needed to look at that. How do we go about changing that template? Do we do it as a as a committee? So, do we do Ms. it as a and then take it back to the board? Because so I McMillian, think this template. Yes, we're going to discuss that under new business. If we could just move forward with uh, voting in sure. the proposals for these and then we'll move on to that in new business. Thank you. You're welcome. So I will now entertain a motion to recommend that items 1 through 19 be moved to the full board for approval and that item 20 as amended be moved to the full board for approval. So moved. Is there, is there a second? Thank you, Ms. Hen. Second, Young. Thank you, Mr. Young. May I have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We will move items 1 through 19 forward and amended item 20 forward at the next full board meeting. So, Thank to, you. 
Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to everyone for all of your information and your input. I think this discussion that we're going to have uh, around the template that we started some time ago, as Mr. McMillian uh, alluded to, uh, will be helpful in um, these discussions as we as we review and approve contracts moving forward. So I have met with Mr. Hartlove and Ms. Webster to review the templates uh, and uh, talk about some of the information that's provided, some of the information based on the discussion in the board meeting. And the goal is to have a recommended format uh, to uh, allow for the efficient and effective review and approval of our contracts for our uh, review uh, in the coming um, in the coming meeting. So, are there any questions or discussion around that? Is there anything you'd like for Mr. Hartlove and team to know regarding your thoughts on the template? Ms. Harvey, I have one um, comment. Yes, ma'am and some background, thank you. Um, I was involved in drafting the temp the changes to the, the most recent changes to the template. Um, so the version that we're currently using was expanded um, quite a bit a few years ago at my suggest, I brought some suggestions forward and the building and contracts committee at that time approved those. So I'd be happy to work with anyone um, engaged in this process now, whether it be Mr. McMillian or yourself on looking at that. Um, and can provide some some additional background and, and information. I think I can contribute to that effort. Oh, thank That's you. Thank all you. From that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other feedback or comments? Okay, uh, so we'll keep you posted on progress. And the last item on the agenda is announcements. The next Building and Contracts Committee meeting will be held on Monday, July 10th, 2023 at 5 p.m. Is there any further business? Hearing none, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you so very much for joining us. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.